together with all of us and uh, to take this time to look at the word and to grow and to uh, see what the word has to say to us. Uh, today's text makes me have to address what we're seeing around us. I didn't plan it this way, but it just happened to be this way um, as we continue in our series through Colossians chapter one. We will be looking at uh, 24, uh, chapter one, 24 through uh, the second chapter, which will go into verse four. So we're excited for this opportunity. Um, and we're gonna let the text speak to us today. So with that, let me pray. And then we're going to jump right into it. Father, we pray that right now that you will speak to us through your word. Lord, I pray that as many of us have come with heavy hearts or with lots of questions as we see the things around us going on, we see a nation that's hurting, we see uh, division, we see pain, we see frustration and anger. Lord, we pray that your word will speak to us because we know that it's only in you that there is an answer, that there's a solution, that there is a way in which we respond. So Lord, we open up our hearts to you today and ask that you and you alone would speak to us, that you and you alone will help us to hear from you. And Lord, I pray that you will remove uh, myself, Lord, may I not be able to hinder your word from going forward, but may I be truthful May I be honest, but may I say exactly what you have intended to be heard today. And may you receive the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, uh, so grateful for, for everything that, that you're doing and that you have done. And I pray that we will have open hearts. Uh, there's a lot going on, right? There's a lot that's happening in the world. There's a lot that's happening on the nation that's right around us. And uh, if we pretend that there's nothing going on or if we... Um, perhaps have this mentality that there isn't a response, a godly response that we're supposed to have. I think that we're kidding ourselves. So um, let me just take us to the text because it's beautiful that the text is the one that is lining us up today uh, with our response. So if you have your word, we're going to be Colossians chapter one, and we're going to start here in verse 24, where we left off. It says, now I rejoice and what was suffered for you. And I fill up my, in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Now there's a lot that's here and there's a lot that's going to be happening in our text. I'm just going to break it up. I'm going to break this up into four sections. I'm going to talk us through what they are and then I'll come back later to actually expound on each section. So the first part says this, what are we getting from this? It's basically, it's to make God fully known, even if I have to suffer. Verses 24 through 25, that's what it's all about. It's to make God known, even if I have to suffer. It's understanding that I will rejoice to make God known, even if there's suffering that goes on, because it's all about his body. It's all about Christ's church. And that's what we have the ability to focus on when we look forward and we look at this section. What does it mean to have to suffer in order for God to be fully known? I'll talk about more of it in later. Let, let's continue on. Verse 26 and 27, when you put those together, here's what you get. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is in Christ you, the hope of the glory. This section, verses 26 through 27, it's about the mystery. And what is the mystery? The mystery is reconciliation. And the reconciliation went on to the Gentiles. Jesus lives within us through the Holy Spirit. And so when we look at this section, we're understanding that there's a, the reconciliation, this is what the whole entire Bible has been all about from the very beginning. We understand that God has always wanted to reconcile us to him, and he wants reconciliation from person to person. And we're going to talk more about this in a minute. So it's about reconciliation. And then we keep going on. We're going to look at verses 28 through 29. We proclaim him 
admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end, I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Here, what we're seeing is this beautiful opportunity to present everyone. He's, he's working hard. What is he working hard to do? He's working hard to present everyone, what? Mature in Christ or perfect in Christ. This is what we long to become, is perfect in Christ. Ooh, mature in Christ. There's a lot of people in the church who aren't mature in Christ. There's a lot of people who say they know the Lord, but they're not very mature in Christ. So we're going to talk more about being mature in Christ in a moment. And then this last section, verses 1 through 4, says, I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and those at Laodicea. And for all who have not met me personally, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have all the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For I was reading, for though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit to delight to see you, how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. In this section here, what we really focus on is that in Christ, we should be knit together in love. Wow. In Christ, we should be knit together in love. Wow. The, the text is speaking directly to us. It is speaking directly to everything that we're seeing that's going on around us. I'm so glad that we're in the middle of a series and that I didn't have to look far and to try to pull up my own scriptures to speak to what's going on in the nation that's around us today. I, I didn't get a chance to make this up. This is strictly from the text. And it's going to give us this great understanding of how do we respond and what do we think about with everything that's going on around us today. Now, I say that because I, I want to start off by saying I'm, I'm carefully understanding the dilemma or the position in which I'm in as a pastor of a pastor of, of a church that has, uh, has multi-ethnic, it has different generations, it has a lot of different features in it, and I understand that there's words that could come out of my mouth right now that may be hurtful. There's words that could come out of my mouth that might make people turn away. There's words that could come out of my mouth right now that might make you frustrated. And carefully, I choose these words to go forward because the intent is never to push down, but it's always to build up because that is the hope that is in the gospel for a chance of healing and hope and restoration and reconciliation. And we go forward carefully, but we go forward looking at the word because the word has the answer. So the first section that we've seen, it came from these verses at the very beginning that we are to make God fully known, even if I have to suffer. And right now, we may have to suffer as Christians, as a body of believers. We may have to suffer in order to make God fully known. God never promised an easy road. And for Paul, we certainly see that by him representing the word, by him speaking up for the gospel, by him following the scriptures, he was in prison. He, was, he had difficulties because he chose to examine and to make the gospel known to all people. He was pushed down. He was persecuted. He didn't do wrong by the word, and he didn't do wrong by the people, but the people did not like what he had to say. And because of that, he found himself beaten. He found himself in prison. He found himself going through a lot of different things. Christ, listen, Christ suffered in death to save the church, right? Would you agree with that? That Christ suffered in death to save the church. But you and I and Paul suffered in his life to help the church. And you and I have this ability to suffer, to make sure that, I mean, what's the church? We're seeing what the church is right now more than any other time in American history. We're seeing that the church is inside of the body of believers. It's not the building. It's inside of the body of believers. And so you and I have this ability to suffer, and we are suffering right now 
to make sure that the individual person knows the Lord. The people are hurting and they need to know the Lord. Brokenness needs to know God's grace. The darkness needs to know the light. We didn't need churches. We don't need churches full of self-righteous people. We need hearts that are full of the love of Christ as explained in the gospel. And we will work tirelessly to make sure that that happens. We will move forward to make sure that that happens. Because if we're not willing to suffer for the name of the gospel, if we're not willing to go forward for his cause and for his righteousness, then what are we really? What is it worth to you? How much does it hurt to you? To make sure that no one is without the gospel truth. And right now, in the brokenness that we see in a country, right now, in the brokenness that we see in a nation, right now, with the anger and the hostility and the frustration and people not being able to see one another, they need to know God fully. Can't sugarcoat this. People need to know God. God is the only answer to everything that we have going on. But you and I have a part that we can play in making sure that the gospel is going forward, to make sure that God is fully known. So what's our response? Will you suffer? Will you have uncomfortable conversations with one another? Because it's in the conversations that people have the opportunity to be able to come together and know God fully. I could say so much right here. I could say so much right here. But I'm going to move on. Because I don't want to get bogged down. I want to get all these points out. But if I deviate from what I have written down, surely I hope and I pray that you can understand that my heart is heavy. I, as your pastor, am broken. I'm dealing with a lot of emotion and a lot of pain right now. And I'm trying to keep it together so that we can have this message go forward. But rest assured, the pain is deep. We get to this next section of text, the ministry, the mystery of reconciliation. Jesus Christ wants us to be reconciled with him. The whole entire text of the word is all about God redeeming and reconciling people back into a relationship with him. And if he wants us to be in a relationship with him, then he also wants us to be in a relationship with one another, even if we're different. Jesus lives within you through the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit is on the inside of us, then how do we respond? We respond with the fruit of the Spirit, with love, joy, and peace. Love, joy, and peace. Love, joy, and peace. That must be the foundation in which we're ever going to have reconciliation. It must be the thing in which we look at so deeply. If the Holy Spirit is on the inside of us, we must operate from this not from secret societies, not from a particular class system, not from a reserved group of people. You know, can I, can I make this make a little bit more sense? When we look at reconciliation, do you know that the Bible says that one in three people will help somebody who is hurting? I know you're thinking to yourself, where does it say that? I don't know that the Bible gives statistics, right? One in three people will help somebody who is suffering. May I remind you of the story of the Good Samaritan? How many people seen the Samaritan, seen the gentleman who was laying for dead on the street? How many people seen him? Three. How many people helped him? One. And we talk about it, and we talk about the Good Samaritan, but it's also about two other people who were too busy to lend a helping hand. Only one of them stopped to care. And I asked myself the question, why did only one stop to help someone who was laying for dead? How could two other people, religious people at that, pass by? And I'm convinced that today, many churches are not dealing with the issue that's in front of us. Why? You see, the, the Samaritan understood what it was like to be disliked. 
to be pushed down, to be considered second rate. The Samaritan understood what it was like to not be accepted. He understood what it was like to be rejected. He understood what it was like to be pushed down. He understood because he was told as a Samaritan that he was not good enough. He was told by the religious leaders that he wasn't pure enough. He understood as a Samaritan what it was like to be looked over and passed by and to be treated like he was from the other side of the street. And he was willing to get his hands dirty. He was willing to have compassion on those who other people said, you're not worthy of compassion. He was willing to come from this place of understanding pain and second rate. And he was understanding what it looked like to, to embrace. And so he said, I will move towards the one who is sitting on the other side of the street, even if it cost me my reputation. Even if people don't understand why would I cross the street, he was willing to do it. The other two passerbys didn't want to be bothered. The other two didn't have a connection. The other two only seen the inconvenience. The other two began to ask, what did the man do to get robbed? The other two wondered if he deserved the condition that he was in. The other two would have to make an investment into a person who they didn't know in order to have compassion on him. It wasn't their friend and it wasn't their family. It would mean that they would have to go from an observation to action. Hmm. How about you and I? Do we see the person who is hurting, who has been left? Do we see the pain? Or perhaps we don't have time for that. Perhaps we only want to look at the situation from the own lens in which we were framed as we grew up in life. Now, I'm not blaming anyone for anything because we all came from a lens in which we grew up in. We all have things that shape the way that we perceive the world around us. As I'm looking at the screen right now, I see many people who are wearing glasses. And if I take and borrow your glasses and I try to put them on my own self, I would have a distorted view and I would not be able to see clearly because my eyes are focusing and, and they have, the doctors that I have 15, 20 vision, which they tell me that's really good and I'm grateful for the vision that I get a chance to experience. But if I put your glasses on, my view will be distorted because your glasses are fit for your condition. And we must understand that there is a lens that's faced across America and depending on how you grew up, the lens will be different in how you see what's going on right now. If you don't understand my situation, if you don't understand how I grew up, then you won't be able to understand how I view what's going on right now. And, and if I don't have the lens and how you grew up, then I can't clearly see how and why you're responding the way that you respond. But if I want to see reconciliation, then during this time, if I want to reconcile, I must be willing to listen to someone else's story who's a little bit different than me. I must be willing to hear their pain before I dismiss their actions. I must be willing to say, tell me about what you're going through and tell me how you're perceiving everything that's going on around you before I suspect that your actions are erroneous. If I really want, if I really truly want, if I really want to make the gospel fully known, if I really want God to be fully known, if I really want to see things get better, then I must begin to engage in this gift of reconciliation, which means I have to do something. I have to shut up. There's too many voices that are going forward right now and not enough listening ears. We must be willing to close our mouth long enough to be able to hear someone else's pain. Yesterday, I was listening to my daughter. She came and she was telling me that the bottom of her foot hurt. Now, I could have instantly said to her, well, it's because you were laying out in the sun. I could have said to her, it's because you were walking around in the water without water shoes on. I could have began to minimize what she was telling me as I watched her limp around. Or I could have been willing to say, show me the bottom of your foot. Show me why it hurts. Show me where the pain is. And today I'm going to move with compassion. And I'm going to look a little bit closer. And it might mean that I have to touch a dirty foot. Because I don't know if she showered. I don't know if she washed it. But that's not my concern. My concern is, is my daughter is in pain. 
And how kind of a father would I be if I'm not willing to look deeper at a foot that is causing her to limp? I'm looking at the condition of a limping person. And if I don't recognize the limp, it doesn't have to do with her wanting to, to be swag and to you know, just have this sway about her. No, the reason why she's limping right now is because of an ailment that's going on that you can't see. There's a foot that is covered with a sock, that is covered with a shoe, that is allowing her to not walk in the full capacity of her ability that was given to her by God because of the pain that is caused by a thorn or something on the bottom of her foot. And if we're not willing to look at one another's foot problem and we only see the limp that is caused inside of a nation right now, but then we're not truly addressing the problem and we will never get to reconciliation. We will never get to the pain that is expressed within one another and we only see the condition. So can I encourage us, if we truly want reconciliation, to take time before we judge someone and to take time to listen to someone. There's pain and there's pain all over. There's pain everywhere. There's pain from police officers who are wondering why are they being targeted? Let me tell you something. Not every police officer is bad. I know a lot of great ones and a lot of great ones in whom I call friends. They're not all bad. And let me tell you something. You don't wanna live in a world where there's no police. They keep law, they keep order. Now, on the same hand of that, not every black person is bad. Not every black person thinks that all police officers are bad. Not every black person doesn't like them. Not every black person is full of hate. Not every black person wants to riot. Not every black person doesn't like white people. There are some great, amazing black people there's some great, amazing Hispanic people. There are some great, amazing white people. In every nation, we could say the same statement about. But let me tell you something. You may not understand why. You may not understand why I have pain in my heart right now. You may not understand why I'm grieving. You may not understand why I'm frustrated. And the reason that many of you may not understand that, if I can be as so bold and so careful with these words, but one of the reasons why that you may not know the pain is because ever since everything has been going on, you haven't called and asked me. You haven't asked me how I'm doing. You haven't asked me my story. You haven't asked me what I've been through. You haven't asked me, have I experienced racism? You haven't asked me, how am I doing being a black pastor of a predominantly white church in a predominantly white denomination that is made up of less than 5% Black, less than 3% black, less than 1% black. You haven't asked me. Is it hard? Yes. Is it difficult? Yes. Have I experienced racism? Yes. Have I had a lot of conversations this week with individuals on all spectrums? Yes. For every person that I had the opportunity to spend 15, 20, 30 minutes with talking and asking the question, I had one beautiful conversation with a gentleman and I asked him this question. I said, do you think that racism exists? And he said to me, no, I don't think so. I said, okay. I said, that, I said no worries. I said, then can I ask you a couple other questions? I said, um, do you know who Emmett Till is? We said, no. I said, do you know what the word lynching means? He said, no. I said, do you know who Rosa Parks is? He said, oh yeah, I know Rosa Parks. I said, well, who was Rosa? She didn't give up her seat. 
Do you know why she didn't give up her seat? Um, <clears throat> something about sitting where she was supposed to. I said, do you know why she had to sit where she was supposed to? And he said, um, I said, it's because she wasn't allowed to sit there. Her skin color pre prevented her from being able to sit there. The conversation ended up being beautiful and, and I asked him if he knew what lynching was and he said, no. I said, well, understand that as I grew up, I was threatened many different times of being lynched. I was told and called outside of my name several times and, and the pain is there. And I have worked very hard to minimize and to suppress and to not let that pain rage up in my heart. But when you see what's going on, it just gets stirred up all over again and, and it causes an emotion. I'm not gonna dwell here, I wanna move on, but I hope that you can understand the pain, the hurt. It's deep. Moving on. The next thing is, in the text, the next section was that we were to present everyone mature in Christ. What does a mature in Christ person look like? Is it the way that we treat others? Is it the way that we love God? The way that we love others? Is it the way that we respond to others? I mean, think about this. When God created man, how did he say that they were made? The scripture said, and let us make God in our image. Therefore, every one of us is an image bearer of God. God created us in his image, which means that when someone sees a Christian, they at the very same time are seeing the image of God. That person has God living on the inside of them. As the Holy Spirit takes up residence in those who have accepted the gospel and the truths of the gospel. So therefore, we raise up that life of one another. We celebrate that life to see an image bearer of the Lord being pushed down, ridiculed, attacked, left for dead or killed, stirs on the inside of the mature Christian. They desire to be Christ-like as they reflect in the protection that Jesus gave, the same protection that Jesus gave to the woman who was caught in adultery. I want you to think about that story for a moment. Was there not a woman who was caught in adultery? Did the people want to stone her? Can I ask a question? In a society where we understand that wasn't, if there was a woman who was caught in adultery, meaning that there had to have been a man that was caught in adultery as well, why was he not brought out as well? The same sin was guilty to both of them. Where was he? And why was he not being questioned? Why was he not being threatened? Because in this world, there's a lens that continuously makes one people group better than another, that makes women less than men, that makes blacks less than whites, that makes Hispanics less than this, and, and so forth and so on and so on. And we understand that Jesus did something beautiful. He stood up for the marginalized. He stood up for the person that didn't have a voice. And he said, I am not here right now in this moment to condemn you, but to protect you. The mature Christian is willing to protect those who don't have a voice. The mature Christian looks at injustice and it looks and says, how can I be of service? Because even if I have to suffer and even if it means that my family members don't like me right now because I have a different viewpoint, I am willing to stand up because as a mature person in Christ, I am willing to say enough is enough. And I'm willing to look at those who have often been overlooked. The mature do not attack one another when they see or understand that someone is grieving. We have become more mature in politics and worldly ideologies than we have become mature in Christ. Our responses align with the far left, the far right, 
instead of aligning with the heart of Christ. These alliances continue to keep us on the opposite side of the street instead of walking next to the person who has been left for dead. I am so tired of the bantering on social media. I'm tired of the polarization that if you side with black people, then you must be against cops. And if you side with black people or vice versa, if you side with the cops then you must not like black people, I'm tired of the statements of black lives matter, all lives matter, police lives matter. See the pain of God's people. See the pain inside of the image bearers that are right next to you. If you say that black people are not in this image, then obviously you're not walking with a fundamental and doctrinal point of view. If you don't think that spilled blood, no matter what race it came from, doesn't spill out into the ground and leave God asking the same question that he asked to Cain, where is your brother, Abel? The response of, I do not know, and am I my brother's keeper? If it was not good enough for Cain, then it's not good enough for you and I as Christians. Our hearts should cry out and say, enough is enough. Our hearts should cry out and say, we must treat people right. The Lord expects us to look out after our neighbor, the neighbor who looks different from you. Otherwise, the command would not have been love God and love your neighbor. It would have been love God and love your family member. However, we know that that's not the truth. The, the truth of the reality is God said to love what? Your neighbor. That includes the person on the other side of the street. That includes the person who is in pain and hurting. That includes the person that talks different from you, walks different from you, is different from you. When you show up without the image bearer that you had an opportunity to walk through life with, but you choose to disregard God's son, to choose to disregard God's daughter, then you have a problem with God. Because you will not be able to show up on that glorious day and say, I treated everybody right. And then he's going to say in the same way that he used the words, you didn't feed me. You didn't clothe me. And you're going to say, but when did I see you hungry and I didn't feed you? When did I see you naked and not clothe you? When did I see you in prison and not visit you? When you have done the least of these, you have also done it unto me. To see someone in pain and not reach out. To see police officers who are doing the right thing and they, they police with a right mentality and a right heart without reaching out to them saying, thank you. To see police who don't do right and continue to live with that mentality that they can be the judge and the juror while also policing is not right and to not hold them accountable and to speak words of life into them or to demand and to cry out and say, treat everybody right. See, for you, when you see this, it might not bring up bad memories to you, but I grew up watching and seeing and hearing of lynching stories and seeing a rope go around someone's neck by an officer, by people who are never going to be held accountable. When you were threatened with that growing up, these things bring back the same pain. So we must become mature Christians and listen and hear one another's story. That's the only way that we'll get to reconciliation and it's the only way that we'll be able to demonstrate God's nature and character to others. And then finally, that last section says, if we should become knit together in love. I like how one gentleman placed this as we look at this beautiful word, which speaks of intimate relationships and unity, which binds us together with those who walk in truth. This, this word is to love, to have that as the frontal part of how we do every single thing that we do. We must reject the idea that believers will be happy or happier when they are racially segregated or ethnically exclusive. To love one another is an all-inclusive command. 
And only, only when it's obeyed will the churches grow to praise Christ. Together, in unity, as it will be done in heaven. I appreciate the words of McNewton, who said these words, who said that we must do it together. But yet, we're so far from it. Do we not recognize that God is always intended to restore the Tower of Babel? And personally, I don't want him to wait until we get back to heaven. I would love to see it now. And we have this ability. Again, three people seeing the man who was beaten, robbed, and hurt in pain. Yet only one of them stopped. Only one of them showed compassion. Only one of them walked in true love that God has called us to walk in. Love does not allow us to turn a blind eye. We must see. We must see the pain. Even if it costs you, I mean, what would it cost those guys, those passerbys, a couple minutes of their life? And even if they didn't have the resources to help, it's not your resources that we look at to make a difference. It's our compassionate hearts and our Christian love and our Christian unity that says, if you're hurting, I'm hurting. Isn't that what the book of Acts is all about? When the church was established, if you didn't have, you did have, because when one of us have, we all have. So I ask you today, my fellow friends, my family, let's hold one another up in love. There's enough negativity going on. There's enough bantering going on. Let us be the voice of reason. Let us be the ones who cry out in the darkness and say, together, we move forward. Let us not do what has been done so many times in the past. Let us not be deviated from the truth of the course that is in front of us. You see, the enemy would love for us to focus our attention only on the rioting and the looting. That's not the issue. It brings disrest, and I am totally against any of that. A lot of people have been quoting Martin Luther King and saying, why can't we demonstrate, and why can't they use the word they, why can't they demonstrate with peaceful protests? A quick history lesson reminds us that even when the peaceful protests were attempted in the past, fire hoses squirted, dogs were sent out, and nightclubs were used. People are hurt and people are tired. Understand the pain, understand the frustration, and please, please engage in a conversation that can bring help. If you're posting, if you're calling, if you're sharing things that are not bringing God's light and his love and his compassion into this situation, then please don't do it. Go back to what we were taught when we were kids. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. I don't use hard language. You have never heard me use profanity. But my hard language would be this. If you don't have anything that's gonna help the situation, shut up. It's as simple as that. And then open up your mouth to the Lord and seek his forgiveness. I'm so proud of our denomination right now because we started a opportunity to hear from some of the leading people within our denomination. And right now the lead has been, let's call for a time of repentance, the denomination and hearing one another in silence and let us hear the voice. And may you engage in the same thing. May I engage in the same thing. Let us hear one another so that we can walk in Christian harmony. I hope it makes sense. 
I hope the words have been helpful. I hope that we respond by going to the Lord. And if we've been carrying some hurt, if we've been carrying pain, and if we've been carrying prejudice, bigotry, animosity, may we be willing to look deep in our own hearts and say, Lord, how have I contributed? Lord, help me to love even the least of these. Help me to love those who are different. Lord, help me to go across the street and help the one who is there. Let me pray. Lord God, we come before you as broken people. We come before you as hurting people. We come before you, Lord, asking that you would look into our hearts. And Lord, where we have not been fair, Lord, where we have pushed people down, where we have not stood to help people up, where we have missed, dismissed the issue and we focus more on the limp instead of the pain. Lord, where we have not done all that we could, even in suffering, to bring the gospel forward, to make you known. Lord, where we have not been willing to suffer, where we have not been willing to reconcile, where we have not been showing love, Lord, please forgive us. Lord, we don't have to have the perfect answer. We don't have to have the right words to say. But Lord, we should engage each other with our ears before our mouth. As many have said that we have two ears and only one mouth, maybe there's a reason for that. So let us, Lord, engage with listening. Let us engage with hearing. Let us engage with true Christian love that we could make sure that we are mature in Christ. And if we're not listening to one another, that's not very mature. If we're adding to the fuel, if we're adding fuel to the fire that's blazing all around us, Lord, help us. Have mercy on this country. Have mercy on the people. Have mercy on the leaders. Have mercy on those who is allowing their pain to speak louder than their love in you. Have mercy on those who want to continue to push people down, to oppress, to, to divide. Have mercy. Allow us to forgive. In your name we pray, asking you to be the change agent, because only in you can this ever get better. Redeem and restore and reconcile the furthest away, back together again. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to leave you with this final, final word. I'm going to read in a moment, 1 John chapter 4, 7 through 12, and 18 through 19. Let that begin to ponder in your heart. I'm going to read it during a benediction. But you got to love. God bless.